Well, um, a hot chocolate. Men's trust in general. That, that are going to be a, a key component of that. So, about 48 hours ago, on Friday night, it really started kicking off. So there's a lot of concern about a kind of a lack of transparency of this decision. So a lot of the discussions, the big picture discussions, were happening behind closed doors, were happening between sort of a few, maybe 20 ministers in a room sitting down and just thrashing things out uh, behind, you know, in a, in a closed off room. It was close to press, it was close to observers. Um, and we really didn't know what was going on at that point. There was very little transparency. I just felt in the dark. I felt so disempowered. Um, I felt I had no way of inputting and no way of raising any concerns I did have with it. And I feel many others, many others, even parties involved, even the nations, um, would have probably felt the same way. So that's pretty much how it is. People kind of propose something, Saudi, USA, Canada block it, and you have to square one. We, we had no way of going, knowing what was going on inside, and that was really hard. We're here to participate in the process and feed in, but we had no idea. So we tried, like on the last day, we did an emergency press conference and tried to get the youth, uh, for, uh, from the youth perspective with young people from Bangladesh, Norway, the UK and New Zealand presenting. So the Canadians did an action where they stood up in plenary and turned their backs on their uh, environment minister. They were applauded but led out of the conference centre. Um, we then had uh, a, a young US girl, a friend of ours called Abigail, uh, who in place of her negotiator uh, giving his speech, she stood up and told him, told the conference that he doesn't speak for American youth and that they needed a safe deal. Uh, and then we had uh, another girl who gave an intervention on Friday, um, which is uh, which is again like loudly applauded. We then did a human mic thing in the plenary, and then there was the big rally that kind of hit the headlines about about with about 100 young people sitting down. So a lot of that was about the sitting down outside plenary and in, in the hall. Um, so a lot of that was about just sort of injecting the sense of urgency and about kind of reminding the negotiators and the ministers why they were here, which was about us and about our future. Well, so I was involved in the protest and the Occupy Carp and I did a kind of mic check, which is where one person shouts and the rest of the young people follow, so it's like a call and response. Which is really powerful and allows you to share personal stories in the crowd. And we did that for two hours, completely blocking the corridors and kind of really making our voices heard and reminding negotiators and ministers there that this is our future and this is the present of people in Africa and, and in, uh, in island nations. We were saying, to telling negotiators to stand with Africa and stand with the island nations and remember that they are playing with people's lives and livelihoods here. There was quite a tangible feeling that this wasn't the best form of democracy uh, and this was just kind of uh, expediency over the democratic process. We don't have hope but we have a chance of hoping. When I go home, I think I'll need some time to reflect and gather myself together, but I think I will get more involved in my local community and also more involved at a national level. This has made me realise that national campaigns do have an impact abroad. I've lived in the UNFGC process and I feel like I'll go home, be isolated on my own um, and just be like, what's going on with the Green Climate Fund? And where is this going? And where's the robot taking us? And on my own, but then that's where I can turn that to positive um, and I can be motivated and I can make sure what I do in my local community is sufficient. So I'm relatively happy, uh, but it's also kind of energised me to go home and really get things, get, 